Hey, what is up you guys? It's Kurt here. So I've been getting a lot of questions lately. People are asking me, Kurt, should I be investing in the stock market today or should I wait for the ultimate bottom when we're in a deep, deep recession? And another common question that I also get is, what is the best stock to buy in right now? Because airlines, automotive, manufacturing, they're all under pressure. And the way I answer all of those questions, because to me, they're ultimately the same, I always tell people, you should be consulting your investment policy statement or your investment plan. And this is what we're gonna be talking about today. What is an investment policy statement and how to create one? So stay tuned. Investing during a recession may not be that different than investing during a bull market. It depends on how you look at it. So in this episode, I want to first start off with defining what is an investment policy statement, IPS. And then we're going to go over how to build an IPS for yourself by going through two examples. One of them is more of a how-to and the other one is a simple real-world example. We'll, we'll use the Bogleheads Weekend on IPS, which I find really good and really simple to understand. It'll give us a great investment policy statement sample to get started. So I myself as a Boglehead and as a do-it-yourself investor, I use that template for my IPS. I really believe that every investor should benefit from having an investment policy statement. It provides the foundation for all future investment decisions to be made and it really contains all of your goals and practically serve as your guiding principles. And with the investment policy statement, you're able to kind of separate your decision making from your action taking because you want your actions to be rooted at what your goals are, your principles for investing rather than emotions. And really in practice, the investment policy statement, it solidifies and defines those investment goals. For example, you may want to say that I want to retire at a certain age. Or I want to retire early. I want to retire at 35 years old if you're part of the fire movement. So if that's your goal, then you should be making decisions uh, and actually should be taking actions which are helping you reach that goal as opposed to maybe jumping on something that is hot or something that is new or you should be reacting to any news in the media. And I think that your IPS really it practically serves as the buffer or it keeps you grounded and it motivates you to stay focused on your goals because it really removes the emotion from investing. It really, uh, you can use the IPS as a reference to see whether or not your portfolio is achieving your stated goals and objectives and it provides support for a long-term buy and hold investment strategy. It helps you not to panic during market recession. Now we're heading into a recession for 2020 but instead of saying, how should I invest now during this 2020 recession, you can go back to investment policy and look at what you've stated as your goals and how you're gonna achieve those goals. So the downsides of not having an investment policy is that you may become very emotional, you may be uh, sort of bound to do what you feel is the right thing to do when it comes to investing. And what you feel oftentimes is not going to be the right choice because it's not a matter of feeling, it's about how the market works and the fact that it's unpredictable and the fact that you can't really time the market. Let's take a look at some investment policy samples. So if you search on Google for DIY investment policy statement or investment plan, you'll find plenty of examples. You just need to be careful that what you're looking at comes from a reputable source. What I'm sharing on the screen here is from Morningstar, a highly reputable site. So the investment policy statement here is really good. It's an excellent template. It's very visual. It's very nicely laid out with all the major sections. You can fill out your target asset allocation in percentages and everything. So you can use that if you wish. By the way, I'm gonna put all of the links, anything that I mentioned in this video in the description. So if you like any of this or any of those templates, you can grab those. But what I really wanna focus in this video today is how in the Bogleheads, the investment policy statement is described 
and two of the examples that I mentioned there. One of them is really a how-to example, how to construct an investment policy statement, and the other one is more of a real-world example. All right, let's take a look at the first example because that's gonna give us really the guidelines of how to construct an investment policy statement. I'm gonna pay attention to each one of the major sections and I'm gonna provide a little bit of detail beyond what's written here. I think you're gonna read this on your own anyway, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of explanation and if you're new to this, some of these terms may not speak to you, so I'm gonna explain what those mean in layman's terms. So starting off with the very first section here, which is the investment objectives. This is intentionally the first section of the IPS because it really gives you the opportunity to state what you want to achieve when you invest in the stock market. For example, an objective could be to retire at a certain age. As I mentioned earlier, if you're part of the FIRE movement, maybe you want to retire at 35, 40 years old, or maybe you want to retire at 60. That's still considered early retirement. Or you may want to leave a meaningful amount to, I don't know, family, grandchildren, whatever the case is. You're probably not thinking about that yet, but just giving you an example. Or you may want to be thinking of, I want to have a certain amount of income in retirement that I can withdraw every year from my portfolio without actually having to worry about running out of money. So these are all good examples for investment objectives. The second most important section within an IPS is the risk tolerance. This basically is a statement that you put very honestly, you need to be honest with yourself if you're a very risk averse person or a very risk tolerance person and if you want to be taking a lot of risk as you're investing. So this is usually based on things like how old you are, what is your financial situation, how much money you have to invest or any kind of um, specifics about your investment and financial goals. It's really individual. Everybody's different. Another major section is your holding limits. Limitations on the minimum and the maximum percentage of investment for each asset class that you want to invest in is absolutely essential. For example, you may want to invest in large cap stocks or think of this as the S&P 500. So you want to put in your IPS that you want to hold anywhere between 15 to 30 or maybe to 50 percent to hold the s p 500. how much you should have in international funds maybe you want a minimal amount of 5 to 15 percent how much you should have in government bonds and how much in corporate bonds so having those ranges of minimum and maximum is really important and this ties also directly to the target asset allocation the target asset allocation, what you see in the table here, it still lists out all those asset classes. But what is not mentioned here is even more important, that your target asset allocation on a higher level is basically the mix of how much you're holding in stocks and how much in bonds. Holding more stocks makes your portfolio more volatile, but you have a higher likelihood of having a higher rate of return. On the other hand, if you hold more bonds, you're going to have a more stable portfolio, but lower rate of return. So this ties back again to the risk tolerance that you identified earlier. If you're very risk averse, then you probably want to hold more bonds. But if you can weather the storm of pretty much any recession or any market downtrend, and you're not really ticked by any of the bad news that you see on television, then you probably can weather a higher percentage of an equity portfolio. So you may be even able to uh, have a hundred percent stocks. So it's really individual, but you need to be honest with yourself. What is the proper target allocation for you based on your risk tolerance? And then another important section is also the selection criteria. So now that you've established which asset classes you want to own, you need to be able to come up with criteria, which is going to help you to select the right funds to buy, which represent say, the large cap US equities or the international funds or the corporate bonds. And I think you can pretty much copy and paste the last sentence here of, of this table, which says the selection criteria should be pretty much the expense ratio and the overall cost of funds should be a major point in the selection criteria. To minimize style drift, index funds are preferred if applicable 
for all asset classes. Indeed, if you can buy and hold index funds for any of the asset classes that you want to invest, which are part of your holding limits, asset allocation, which correspond to your risk tolerance, then you probably can go with these index funds because they're very low cost. So that puts more money in your pocket or rather more money invested than paying higher fees to active managers and to actively managed funds. Another section is the review process. And this section really talks about, you know, how often you should be looking at the portfolio, what is the monitoring mechanism that you want to use. And really, uh, this is, you need, you need to look at this as a program, as an investment journey for yourself. And what, you know, the Bogoheads recommend is that since this is an investment program and it's a long term in nature, the periodic adjustments made to this investment program should be small. In other words, if you look at your IPS and yes, you may review the IPS. Yes, you may review your target asset allocation, but that should not be happening very often. Maybe once in every X number of years, for example. Uh, and this is really dependent on if your financial situation changed drastically, uh, then you can adjust this IPS. And the last section here is the rebalancing. So the rebalancing, it really talks about that, that asset mix that we talked about, how much in stocks, how much in bonds. Maybe once a year, as you look at your portfolio and you may have targeted to have 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds, at the end of the year, if that asset mix has been, you know, going out of proportion, you can use the opportunity to rebalance. Having said all that, let's take a look at the real world example here, which is Sunny's IPS, which is the second table in this article. I think it's pretty much a short and sweet IPS. It's very effective. And I really think it's going to be suitable for most of you to just copy and paste and probably you just need to change that middle section here, but you already have about 80 or 90% of what you need to be putting in your IPS. So let's take a look at what Sonny has in his IPS uh, statement. So the philosophy or the goals that he has, actually he's used a quote from Jack Bogle and the quote says, buy and hold long term, all market index strategies implemented at rock bottom costs are the surest of all routes to accumulation of wealth. Now, I really like this quote by Jack Bogle, by the way, because it simply says, if you just buy and hold long term index funds and index funds are the cheapest that you can buy, whether that's an ETF or Admiral shares, then you really, that's the best you can do to guarantee you success as an investor to accumulate wealth. The second section that Sunny has is the asset allocation. And Sunny says, maintain an overall 60-40 stocks fixed income allocation until home purchase to accumulate both short-term and long-term requirements. Assets should be diversified across major asset classes, including domestic equity, international equity, uh, conventional bonds, and short to intermediate term tips. All right. So basically, he's saying, I want a somewhat of a conservative strategy where I have 60% stocks, 40% fixed income, or that's bonds, maybe mixed with cash or money market funds. And that is good enough. He's got some target to say, purchase a home, etc, etc. The next section, funds and accounts, that's also a very important section. He says, use low cost mutual funds, index funds, preferably, which do not overlap and provide maximum diversification across asset classes. Try to assume only market risks as far as possible. Try to shelter tax inefficient funds in tax advantage accounts to reduce tax drag. So basically, uh, bonds and stocks, they have different tax efficiency associated. So you want to be smart about this, where you put your tax inefficient funds or asset classes into tax advantage accounts, such as 401ks and IRS, etc. And more details on this, we can see in the next section, the target allocation. So Sonny is putting the total stock market fund, which comprises 45% of his portfolio into a taxable account. A taxable account is basically a good housing for all the tax efficient funds. 
So the total stock market, especially if it's an ETF, it's very efficient. He also has total international market fund and that he decides to put in his Roth IRA. So international funds, they're not as tax efficient as a total US market. That's why he intentionally is putting it into a shielded account such as the Roth IRA. And for my global investors, by the way, if you're wondering, you don't quite have that option necessarily, but you can buy just all-in-one global fund. Uh, iShares has one, Vanguard has one, and with just one fund, you'll be basically covering those two uh, funds that are enumerated here in this target allocation. And Sunny also has tips as a 20%, you're putting this into the IRA. He also has intermediate bonds, 20%, and also a money market fund, which is the six months worth of expenses in a taxable account. It isn't a taxable account because you actually have access to that money, right? It's a, that's important for, for your emergency fund to be either in a money market or maybe a laddered CD. And the last section of Sunny's investment policy statement is the other consideration, basically miscellaneous. And this is also a very good section. He says, automate future contributions wherever possible. Rebalance yearly, no market timing. And let me stop here because it's quite a bit of information. Automating future contribution basically means with every paycheck, you should have an automatic fund transfer to your uh, either IRA or 401k or your taxable account, a fixed amount, say $100 or $1,000, whatever it is, and then that amount gets automatically invested in accordance to your target allocation, all right? He says rebalance yearly, so he's chosen to rebalance once a year. Some people choose their birth date to rebalance. Some people say January 1st is where I have time to look at my account to rebalance. Either is good. No market timing. I think I've spoken a lot of times on my videos about that it's impossible to time the market. And in this case, Sunny also has this in his IPS. He also says exact sub-allocations are not as important as maintaining the overall 60-40 stocks to fixed income allocation. No need to make things complex in order to meet sub-allocation targets. So in other words, in his view, it's more important to keep that 60-40 ratio between stocks and bonds, and it's not as important to really be exactly 45% in a total stock market or exactly 20% in intermediate term bonds. If it's anywhere between two to three percent, you know, granted it will fluctuate, it can't be exact, that is okay. More importantly is how much you have in stocks and how much in fixed income because as I already mentioned, that really hits what is going to be your risk exposure and what is going to be your rate of return. So that's guys how you build an investment plan or investment policy statement. If you've got any questions or comments around this, put them down in the comment section. I'll try to address them as quickly as possible. And as always, if you like this video or if it was helpful to you, destroy the like button, share this video with a friend or a family member, anybody that can benefit from this information, because I truly believe that collectively, we can all help each other become better investors and better with managing our money. By the way, this week we got quite a few new subscribers, so I wanna give a special shout out to each and every one of you. If you've got any burning topics, you can put them in the comment section or you can DM me on Instagram or Twitter and I can make a video about it if a lot of people would benefit from this kind of topic. So until next time, make sure you stick to investment policy statement. I hope you create one. Make sure you stay invested and stay the course.